Ah, thank you. So distributed computing is all about fault tolerance. It's really the study of the kinds of decisions you can make based on partial and incomplete and inconsistent information. And uh, normally this is studied through combinatorial or through non-combinatorial methods. And uh, what uh, we've been trying to do is to apply various kinds of uh, combinatorial topology to these uh, questions. Now, <clears throat> one thing that the uh, field is blessed with many, many models of failures. And perhaps the simplest model of failure is <laughs> crash failure model. So the crash failure model, you have an adversary who is passive aggressive. Just when you need to know something, it falls silent. And you're waiting for a message from some place and it doesn't show up. You make a decision in the absence of a message and then the message shows up. But the only thing the adversary can do is to cause participants to halt. Uh, that's that's standard crash failure model. There's also a, um, a much more demanding model called the Byzantine model. So in the Byzantine model, the adversary can lie to you. So instead of remaining silent at the wrong time, the adversary can say, oh, the median was 24, when it wasn't. And if the adversary controls several players, the players can conspire. And they can do the worst possible thing for your algorithm. And the players, the, the Byzantine players can try to make you do wrong decisions. They can try to make you run uh, forever for too long. And uh, they can do, uh, there's no end to the evil that they can do. And the question is, what kinds of things can be computed in this uh, uh, extremely hostile environment? And the, uh, of course, if everybody is Byzantine, you can't do anything useful. But if you place restrictions on the number of Byzantine participants, uh, then you can do some interesting things. Now, the particular result that I want to talk about here is kind of suggested uh, by this is that the crash failure model might seem fairly easy and the Byzantine model might seem impossibly difficult, but in fact we can map from one to the other. And uh, the, oh, surprisingly, perhaps, the only things that change are the uh, number of faulty uh, players that you can uh, tolerate. Uh, that in fact, uh, things that might seem to be extremely difficult can be systematically transformed into something that's already fairly well understood. <clears throat> now, uh, ostensibly, I'm going to be talking about a particular uh, a technical paper, but uh, given this audience, I'm going to focus more on the elementary aspects of what we're doing, because kind of like the last talk, I'm uh, working from the assumptions that you don't know much about this area, but you want nothing more than to get involved in this and uh, prove a theorems and otherwise uh, increase the population of people who uh, we can talk to and have fun with. So uh, what this paper says was we can take any... Uh, you can ignore the phrase colorless, that's a technical term that uh, we don't need to worry about. <coughs> uh, by task, I'll explain what a task is in a second, but basically it's a, a unit of computation. Uh, that we can transform any Byzantine problem into a kind of a dual uh, crash failure problem. And crash failure problems are well understood. And so this is a kind of an argument by, uh, by reduction. And the idea is that, uh, naively, since Byzantine processes can do anything they want, and they can lie convincingly about what they think, they can, they can lie about what someone else said, in fact, we can reduce things to a situation where the only thing the Byzantine processes can do is lie about their initial states. That if they try to lie about anything in the middle, we can catch them. Uh, which is uh, uh, somewhat surprising. And uh, here what I'll do is I'll give you simpler proof than uh, earlier ones in the uh, literature. Now, <clears throat> in order to talk about computation, we want to distill computation to its simplest non-trivial form. So I'm going to talk about something where we have a collection of processes, and each process starts out with an input, private to itself. You know, the input could be its serial number, it could be something that was received uh, uh, on a wire, it could be something that it saw coming in the window. It's just something that that process knows. Uh, the processes communicate with each other. And uh, here we don't need to be too careful about what kind of communication that is. They could send messages, they could uh, read and write shared memory, they could use smoke signals. Uh, there's some kind of information transfer that happens. And then in the end, uh, each one chooses an output value and halts. 
And the requirement is you have to choose your output value after a finite number of steps and a finite amount of communication. So you can't have loops and you can't have anything that is potentially unbounded. And you have to tolerate a certain number of failures. Uh, in the crash model, that says that some of the participants may just stop answering. And in the Byzantine model, it means some of the participants might just lie to you and make things up and uh, think, what is the most confusing thing I could possibly say and say it? Uh, it doesn't matter if they lie to each other because they're all conspiring to cause you, the honest uh, processors, to, uh, to fail at your task. Why would they do that? Why would they do that? Um, Bitcoin. You know, all these you know, yellow Russian hackers are trying to steal your money. <laughs> Sorry, Dimitri. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one uh, fairly standard task is consensus where everybody has to agree on somebody's input. So you have to agree it has to be somebody's input. It has to be somebody's input to rule out uh, trivial uh, cases. Uh, one thing that we'll talk about here is something called case set agreement, which is a weakening of consensus where you're allowed to choose k distinct inputs, but no more than that. And that's going to turn out to be a, a, a useful, have a geometric interpretation that's uh, very uh, useful. Uh, so our model, sort of the the combinatorial language that we're going to use to talk about this is I'm going to represent a process state as a vertex, which you can think of either as an abstract, part of an abstract simplex, or uh, something that lives in a sufficiently high dimensional uh, Euclidean space. And I'm going to use color to represent the ID, the name of the process. I'm going to label it with a state, which in this case is mostly going to be integers. So here the green process has value 7. I'm going to <coughs> take a collection of compatible states, meaning states that could all be held simultaneously, and I'm going to link them into a, a, a simplex. So this says, here's a global state of a system of three processes, where uh, the bluish one has zero, the red one has one, and the green one has two. And after a while, I'm going to stop drawing the little uh, bug uh, things and just, just write vertices. Uh, the nice thing about simplexes, is I can represent multiple states. And here we have two possible global states that differ only in the state of the green process. And the fact that these two triangles meet along an edge mean that the processes on the edge can't tell which global state uh, they're in. So if you're green, you know which of these two uh, you're in because you have a different value. But uh, blue and red uh, can't tell the difference. And this is geometrically represented, this notion of ambiguity by uh, uh, intersections. So uh, the set of all possible global states is a sublicial complex. Uh, here's an example. So suppose we want to do consensus where everybody starts out with a 0 or a 1. You can think of yes, as yes or no. We have three processes. Uh, <coughs> we're going to look at all the possible assignments of 0 and 1 independently to three processes. That defines this uh, simplex here, which is uh, you know, a sphere. Uh, if you have n plus 1 processes and you, and you assign 0 and 1 independently, then you get an n-sphere, combinatorial n-sphere. Um, all possible initial states, three processes, independently assigned uh, values. <coughs> so this tells you all the possible initial states of your system. Uh, since we want to do consensus, there's only two possible output states. Uh, everybody decides 0 or everybody decides 1. And uh, these are two disconnected uh, simplexes. Uh, so uh, it's not enough to say these are the inputs and these are the outputs. You also need to say, well, if you, all, if you start out with all zeros, then you have to decide zero. So we'll say if you have all zero inputs, then your possible outputs are, is the all zero simplex. Uh, and this occluded uh, all one input simplex, you go to the all one outputs. If you have mixed outputs, you can decide either, one, either 0 or 1, but you have to agree. And uh, this is a special kind of map we call a, a carrier map. Uh, so uh, task specification uh, is this triple consisting of input-output and the relation between them. And uh, th you know, this is the sort of fundamental thing that uh, we study in the, uh, this branch of distributed computing. Uh, 
colorless tasks, and again, this is a little bit of a technicality, but I have to say it, <coughs> which is where we don't care who gets which value. All we care about are the values themselves. And we don't particularly care how many times this value shows up. So we'll say that the set of inputs determines the set of outputs. The identities of the participants uh, doesn't uh, matter. Uh, we can prove things uh, where the identities do matter, but it, it, it's slightly more complicated and uh, not, but not so terribly more interesting. So examples are that we've seen are consensus. See if I uh, ro if I rotate the uh, uh, values that the output, uh, values they're both okay. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you sort of the fundamental theorem for crash failures. This is the passive aggressive adversary that just is just quiet. And this is, uh, for those of you who are here for the school, that, that's what I covered in, in my previous talk. It says that if I have a uh, colorless task given by input, output, and carrier a map, and I want to tolerate t uh, crash failures, so that means that up to, I know that up to t of them uh, might uh, fail to uh, uh, speak up at any point. Uh, then there's a protocol, if and only if, I can take the input complex, uh, drop down to the T skeleton of the simplex, take a continuous map from that polyhedron to the polyhedron of the output complex in a way that's uh, compatible with the uh, carrier map that defines the, um, the task. So that says that you drop down to a lower dimensional skeleton depending on how many failures you're willing to uh, tolerate. Uh, then you should be able to sort of continuously deform that to your output in a way that matches uh, the problem specification. So in particular, once you've dropped down the T-skeleton, you can't rip any holes or do any non-continuous uh, stuff. But the, there is a sort of non-continuity when you drop from the input complex down to the uh, uh, skeleton. So that's uh, quite uh, simple. Uh, how does this work? Uh, well, um, this is very hand-wavy, but the intuition is kind of sound. Suppose I start out, I have an input complex uh, that doesn't have a continuous map to the output complex uh, because the, about, you know, the, the boundary uh, wraps around a hole and that's, a, that's an obstruction. So what I can do is I can uh, drop down to the T-skeleton algorithmically and then there's a map. And how does, uh, how does uh, that work? Well, I want to go from the input complex and have everybody drop uh, off of the big uh, simplexes onto the lower dimensional simplexes. Uh, well, I can, uh, I can do that with a, uh, a I'll, I'll talk about this later, with the T-set agreement protocol. Because then everybody puts in their inputs, which might all be distinct. You end up with T distinct ones. That's uh, actually dropping to the face of the uh, simplex. Uh, the other part is... <coughs> We can define something called a barycentric agreement protocol, where I take a simplex, I take its barycentric subdivision. Uh, the participants start out on the vertices of the uh, simplex, and uh, they all converge to the vertices of uh, something in the barycentric subdivision. And uh, that's another algorithmic uh, tool which uh, we can do in the crash failure model. Uh, again, I don't have time to talk about uh, that here, but that's a uh, you know, with a combination of the T-set agreement to drop down to a lower skeleton and the barycentric agreement, which we'll use for to do simplicial approximation of the continuous map, then that's how we build our, uh, our algorithms. So um, I'm going to give you the uh, fundamental uh, theorem for Byzantine tasks, which is going to look slightly mundane, and then I'm going to explain to you uh, why actually it's... Uh, kind of surprising that something so mundane would come out of such a wild and crazy model of computation. So it says when <coughs> the number of processes, n plus 1 is the number of processes. It's not n because we want the dimensions to, to work out right. So if n plus 1, the number of processes, is bigger than 2 plus the dimension of the input complex, multiplied by t, where t is the number of Byzantine processes. So this says that the number of Byzantine processes has got to be pretty small. When that's true, uh, basically the condition is the same. So you drop down to the T-skeleton, you find a continuous map, and uh, we can take the, turn that map into an algorithm. We can show if an algorithm exists, then there exists this, this continuous map. So the only thing that's different between crash failure and Byzantine 
is this restriction on the dimension? Because a crash failure model has no restriction on dimensions. So what this says is that uh, Byzantine adversaries are powerful. You better make sure that there's not too many of them. If there's too many of them, we can't do anything at all. In the crash failure model, no matter how many crash failures you have, there's something interesting you can do, unless, of course, everybody crashes. So this is the, uh, the distinction. So um, to try to explain why this is um, kind of counterintuitive, let's uh, think about the implications of Byzantine uh, uh, failure model. So here we have our processes, and let, let's imagine that they uh, communicate by pairwise sending messages. So a good process writes a message on pieces of paper, folds them up into paper airplanes, and sends them to all of its neighbors. So it broadcasts to his neighbors. And so here, for example, Red is sending uh, pictures of cherries to all of its neighbors. Uh, green is sending pears. And uh, the purple is sending uh, plums. And so a good process sends the same message to, to everyone else, broadcasts it to everyone else. It's, a, it's an asynchronous model, so they might arrive at different times. But uh, communication is reliable, so the messages will eventually uh, get there. Okay, we have crash failures. A standard model says, well, what can happen with crash failures? Well, the process that crashes could just be silent. Uh, it could be the case that it crashed partway through and it sends a message to one neighbor but not another. So here, the, uh, this uh, process managed to send a, a message to, what, to uh, one neighbor, but then crashed before sending another one. Now, the thing about a um, Byzantine process, though, is it's not restricted to sending only a subset of its messages. It can send any messages at once. So it can send lemons in one direction and cherries in the other direction. And what can happen is, so purple, uh, suppose that what you do is you get a message and then you uh, send another message saying, uh, my friend said this, my friend said, my friend said this. You can end up in a situation where purple knows that something is wrong, but can't quite tell what. So it says that, I thought that uh, I heard, for, I got cherries from red, and red said that uh, green sent bananas. Uh, but green says that he got lemons from red, and... Um, uh, that, uh, and that green sent uh, uh, pears. So in this case, green is telling the truth and red is lying. Uh, but purple can't tell this because there's another scenario where the, they're reversed and you can get the same set of messages. So it's impossible to distinguish between these two situations. So you can tell that one of your colleagues is Byzantine, but you can't tell which one because you just mathematically don't have enough information to, to tell. Okay, so let's look at a simple um, question and say, I want to um, figure out some valid input from somebody. So it's not too much to ask. I just want to know what, what is somebody's, everybody's sending me temperature information, can I just get one temperature number that I know isn't uh, made up? Well, if I hear T copies of the same value, uh, I'm not going to believe it, because there could be T failures. You know, they, they might all be uh, evil liars. So as long as I hear T copies, then uh, nope, I don't believe it. If I hear T plus 1, on the other hand, uh, then I can believe it. So if I get T plus 1 copies of any value, because I know at least one of them is honest and telling the truth. So generalizing this, what do I need in order to learn at least one valid input? Again, this seems like a very simple question, but it's... Uh, so, <clears throat> if each input that I see is reported by only T processes, then I don't know, I can't accept any one of them. I know that of these two, one of them has got to be valid, because there are only T uh, uh, bad guys, but I don't know which one it is, so I can't pick either one. Also, T of them could be silent. Now, what does silence mean? Silence could mean that, well, they're Byzantine and they're just being passive-aggressive and not saying anything, or it could be they're slow. And they're really healthy, but they're going to send a message, but I can't afford to wait because maybe it'll never show up. So this way, I have T plus one processes that I can't, that I can't trust. 
So I'm getting a lot of information, but I can't answer even the most elementary question about that. So uh, if I do the arithmetic, uh, there's t processes that fall in, into each of these things. <coughs> this is a dimension of input. These are the number of possible input values, uh, plus one, because that's the way dimensions work. Uh, I, I multiply each one by t. So I've I, can, I can learn nothing if the number of processes is less than or equal to two plus the dimension of inputs multiplied by t because of this scenario. So this is where our dimensional uh, requirement comes from. And none of this is true if you only have crash failures. If you have crash failures, if you hear a value, you know it's got to be a correct uh, value. The only thing you worry about is maybe you don't hear a value. So that means that t is uh, pretty small. And this isn't surprising because, of course, it's going to be more difficult to uh, compute uh, functions in the presence of actively malicious inputs as opposed to uh, passively uh, faulty inputs. And again, uh, this uh, dimension here uh, doesn't show up in crash failures. So um, following that sketch for the fundamental theorem that I gave you, uh, all we need to prove this theorem now is I need a Byzantine resilient T-set agreement algorithm, and I need a Byzantine resilient barycentric agreement algorithm. And uh, if I can do that, then uh, then we're all set. So <coughs> first let's talk about uh, message passing. And this is where a lot of the hard work is uh, done. So I'm going to assume that uh, everybody, that communication runs in kind of asynchronous layers. Everybody communicates with everyone else. It's not synchronous in the sense that everybody broadcasts at 1 o'clock and then, and then again at 2 o'clock. Uh, you just broadcast. When you get the messages, you move on to the next round. So they can overlap in time. But it's useful to, la to label things with layered numbers to make it easy to talk about it. Uh, we have to decide after a finite number of steps. And uh, the way this works is that I can't just participate in the protocol and then say, well, I got my answer, I'm going home. I need to keep forwarding messages even after I've decided. And so this is something that's a little bit weird, but you can prove that it's uh, required, that you have to have kind of a process running in the background that forwards messages forever. You can't ever shut down your system because you never know when the entire computation is, uh, is finished. Uh, messages have a form, uh, they're labeled with the sender, uh, labeled with the tag telling you what kind of message this is, and then some uh, sequence of values. Uh, the sender can't be forged, so these are authenticated messages. If you can forge a message, then, uh, you know, then you're really in trouble. But uh, the, here, <coughs> one way or another, we can guarantee, I can tell that a message came from you, even if I don't trust you. I, I know it, it came from you. Uh, the, uh, you can make up any message type you want in any sequence of values if you are a faulty Byzantine process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this very simple, reliable message passing and turn it into something called, uh, called reliable broadcast send and reliable broadcast receive which gives you much stronger properties. So uh, and this is adapted from uh, ancient uh, earlier uh, work. This is simpler than what they did, but it's really their idea. So uh, what properties do we want? Well, we, we're going to get all kind of lawyer-like at this point. So we'll say that if a non-faulty process never broadcasts a message uh, using this uh, reliable ascend, uh, then a non-faulty uh, process never receives it. So it means if you're non-faulty and I'm non-faulty, then I never think I got a message from you which you never sent. Non-faulty liveness says that if a non-faulty process does broadcast something, then it will eventually be received. So if I'm honest and I do what I'm supposed to do, I can guarantee that, that uh, you get the messages I sent you and you don't see, get phantom messages that appear to be from me. Uh, if uh, two non-faulty processes both receive messages, which might be sent by Byzantine processes, uh, then they're the same message. So I don't think that I got a message from Dimitri uh, that is different from the one that Elizabeth got from Dimitri, for example. Whether or not Dimitri is uh, trustworthy or not. 
Uh, global liveness says that uh, if non-faulty processes uh, uh, receive them, you know, then both, <coughs> both receive, then uh, if one non-faulty receives it, then the other one that does as well. So what that says is that the only way that a Byzantine process can misbehave and not get caught, so if you catch a process misbehaving, you can ignore it. So the only way you can go through and not get caught is by lying about your input value. Because if you try to send different messages to different uh, uh, processes, then uh, the uh, algorithm I'll show you will catch it. So um, I'm going to give you kind of a brief description of the algorithm so that you get a sort of a sense of how they work. I'm not going to try to prove that they're correct because the proofs aren't all that exciting, you know, but they're, they're kind of straightforward, you know, homework problems. So uh, Blue wants to broadcast a message to everyone reliably. So it sends out a message saying, uh, you know, labeled with its name, the value it wants to send, and a, a tag that says, I'm sending this message for the first time. Each recipient says, is this the first time that I got a send message from that process, uh, you know, with, with this value? Uh, if I've seen something before that says send from that process, I'm going to ignore it. Uh, but if this is the, the very first time, then I'm going to forward it, uh, replacing it with an echo tag, saying, uh, hi, I'm Q, I heard this message from P, I'm echoing it. And I'm just going to, and I'm going to do this forever. Every time I see such a message, the first time I see it, I'm going to forward it. <coughs> now, uh, if I get echo messages from all but T, then I'm ready to move on to the next. Why all but T? Well, I can't wait for more than uh, that, because one way Byzantine processes can manifest themselves is by just never sending a message. So if I try to wait for more than this, I could be stuck waiting forever. And if my protocol did that, uh, that's exactly what the Byzantine processes would do. So as soon as I hear from all but T, then I have to uh, do something. Uh, I know I, can w I can't wait for, I won't wait forever uh, necessarily uh, waiting, f you know, waiting for uh, that many <coughs> because the number of good processes are guaranteed to eventually deliver messages. So it's always exactly all but T. So if I get those, then I'm going to forward this with a ready um, uh, tag, which says that, you know, I'm confirming what I said before. So this is basically confirming on top of confirming. And if this is the first time that I received from T plus one, now if I receive T plus one copies of a message, then as in the example I showed you before, I know that one of them was sent by an honest process because there are only T uh, bad guys. So if I get T plus one copies of this message, then I know that it's good. So some of these messages we want all but T, some of them we want T plus one. And uh, you know, why this is so is uh, you, know, you can discover in the depths of the, of the proof. Uh, so then uh, we basically continue this. So th after three rounds of broadcast, uh, then we deliver the uh, message. And <clears throat> again, I don't have time to prove this, but this protocol actually satisfies those conditions that I showed you before. So the Byzantine processes can lie about, they can make up a message and broadcast it to everyone, but they can't create confusion by sending a message to one and not to the other, or by sending a message over here and re remaining silent over there. Because uh, once they broadcast it, enough good processes pick up the message and forward it and validate it and so on, that, uh, that it works. Uh, so, so again, uh, we have a uh, beautifully elegant uh, proof of correctness in, in our uh, book. Uh, uh, so, um, now that we have this communication substrate, we can now start building serious algorithms. So here is the algorithm that we use every time we want to read a reliable value, meaning I want to read a value and be sure that it was somebody's input. So <clears throat> what I get is I'm going to get a set of messages with values, and I'm going to return a set, and the set that I return are guaranteed to be authentic in the sense that it isn't some value that uh, Byzantine process just made up out of thin air. And so what I'm going to do is, I'm go first I'm going to wait until I hear from all but T, which is, I can always uh, do because uh, that's how many uh, reliable processes that I know are going to send me the message. Uh, that's how many exist. I can't wait for more. Uh, I'm going to say a value is trusted if it's reported by T plus one. 
and it's safe to, so I'm going to wait till I get a, a, um, a trusted value. And it's safe to uh, wait for either one of these conditions because sooner or later one of these two things will happen. You know, either I'll get t plus one copies of the same value, then I can quit early, or I'll hear from all but t, and uh, then uh, either there's no trusted values or, uh, or, or there are some. So once I can do this, then uh, set agreement is actually easy. Because set agreement says that uh, I'm going to ask for trusted, a set of trusted values, and I'm going to pick the uh, smallest uh, one. Now, it's not too hard to see that if we all uh, get, if we all run this protocol, then uh, we might end up with different sets of values because of uh, you know, asynchrony and, and so on. But uh, the number of lower values that are valid that are missing can be at most t. So we pick the lowest value, then we're guaranteed that we're not going to pick more than t plus one distinct uh, values. And so, so this is a very uh, simple uh, t-set agreement uh, protocol. Now remember, we want to do t-set agreement because this corresponds to processes that start out on a, a big fat simplex dropping down to the uh, uh, t-skeleton, which is the, you know, the first step of our uh, a generic protocol. <clears throat> okay, so barycentric agreement, which is actually fairly straightforward in crash uh, failure model, is um, a little bit more, actually a lot more complicated uh, in this uh, Byzantine uh, model. So here, what we want is um, everybody ends up with a set of vertices with the property that if I compare any collection of values that people uh, receive, they're ordered by inclusion because that's what defines a barycentric agreement in a combinatorial way. So a vertex of the uh, uh, barycentric subdivision is just a ordered sequence of faces. So uh, this is the data structure. So the subscript represents the uh, process. So this is process I. Uh, so it keeps track of all of the messages that received from everyone. It's always a good start for a distributed <coughs> algorithm. I'm going to keep track of the, uh, <coughs> actually, I'm, I'm going to keep track of this kind of matrix of uh, messages uh, from, P, from PI, received by PI from PJ. I'm going to um, keep the messages that I received addressed to me. And here I'm going to keep track of everybody who agrees with me. So we'll say that another process is your buddy if they have the same, uh, they've received all the same messages as you. And basically we're, we're going to run until you get enough buddies so you can be sure that uh, you converge. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to send, reliably broadcast my input. Then I'm going to uh, receive everyone else's input vertices. Now at this point everybody has a set of vertices you know, everybody starts out on, on, with, on the vertices of a simplex. You're sending vertices to everyone else, so now everybody, in some sense, has a face of that simplex. The problem is those faces aren't ordered in any uh, way. So, so it's not uh, yet uh, useful uh, to us. So in the background, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, forward all the messages that I get. So every time I learn a new input uh, vertex, I'm going to record it locally. And then I'm going to uh, forward it to everyone with a tag saying, hey, I heard about this uh, vertex. If you haven't heard about it, at, please add it to your set. So uh, there's a lot of forwarding uh, going on here. And we need the forwarding because we need the good processes to send enough messages to overwhelm the bad guys. And this is why uh, you, this background forwarding can't ever quit, because you can't uh, detect uh, termination. So then this is the uh, heart of the uh, protocol. So it's saying, uh, as long as I don't have enough buddies, so as long as I don't have enough uh, other processes that uh, agree with me, okay, then I'm going to accumulate all the new reports. Remember, reports are either new vertices that I hear directly or vertices that have been sent to me indirectly by others. And remember, most of them are from good processes. T of them uh, might be processes that are trying to frustrate me by sending uh, something that's, uh, uh, that, that's wrong. Uh, 
and uh, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to record uh, the message. I'm going to uh, build the set of uh, buddies. D don't worry too much about the details of the uh, of the code. But basically, you're sending the same thing over and over again, accumulating new information, sending it, and then eventually, uh, the proof is you reach a kind of a stable point. We've learned everything that you're going to learn. Everyone else has learned everything they're going to learn. You can eventually detect this, and then and then you're done. So uh, we need to show that uh, <coughs> everybody's decisions are totally ordered. So the statement of the lemma says that if PI and PGA are non-faulty, because we don't care what the others uh, think, then it's always the case that uh, their tentative uh, values are ordered by inclusion, uh, one way or the other. And uh, again, I don't have time to approve this, so you just have to uh, take, my, uh, take my word for this. Another uh, thing that I have to prove is that a non-faulty process always decides in a finite number of steps. So the Byzantine processes would like nothing better than to have you run forever without deciding. And uh, they are very clever about uh, doing offline computations and figuring out uh, what would confuse you the most. And uh, nevertheless, uh, they uh, can't uh, do that. You always converge to a correct answer after a finite number of rounds. And again, uh, I don't have time to, uh, to prove this. It's, you know, it's not that hard, uh, really. There's no, uh, you know, just inductive arguments. Uh, so then, <coughs> so now we can go back and visit the fundamental theorem again. And it says that, uh, again, we need this condition here in order to get any reliable inputs. Because if the number of processes is smaller than this, then we can't trust any inputs uh, whatsoever, and we can't make any decision. Because there's some scenario in that any value that we see, which appears only t times, was produced uh, spuriously by the Byzantine processes. So you can't ever gamble on picking any of those. And particularly if you had a deterministic uh, way of choosing it, the adversary knows this, and that's the one they'll, um, um, they'll fake. So then <coughs> it says we have a t Byzantine, meaning we tolerate t of these incredibly evil and clever uh, adversarial processes. Uh, Read-write protocol you, you could be message passing a protocol. If and only if uh, there's a continuous map from the T-skeleton to the output that's uh, carried by, uh, by delta. So all that says is that if the number of Byzantine processes is small enough, then it's not essentially different from the crash failure case even though superficially, uh, the adversary is much, much more fearsome than the crash failure adversary. But the only way that, uh, the only advantage that the adversary has is that you just have to have many more uh, honest processes to outvote the uh, evil uh, Byzantine processes. Uh, how, just a quick sketch of how this works. Given a map, how do I build the protocol? Uh, well, <coughs> I can take a simplicial approximation of that map. Uh, you know, I take some number of barycentric uh, subdivisions. Big N here is the com computational complexity. And then I solve, I do barycentric agreement and T-set, I do T-set agreement to drop to the skeleton, barycentric agreement to uh, do a um, simplicial approximation of the uh, continuous map, and that's, uh, that's an algorithm. Uh, other way around follows immediately from the crash failure case. So if I, if, I have, if I have a crash failure um, uh, protocol, then I have a, a, a map. And uh, you know, if I have a Byzantine uh, protocol, well, that's also crash failure protocol. Therefore, I have a map. So that part's easy. Um, there's a technical restriction which I didn't uh, mention, uh, which is uh, that the... Uh, there's a kind of obscure technical requirement that the task has to have for any of this to work. And I don't really have time to go into this. Almost every task you can think of satisfies this. Uh, there are tasks that don't satisfy this, which are, are kind of pathological. And, uh, um, you know, but they do exist. Uh, final question is, well, what if, what can you do if you don't satisfy this dimensional restriction of having a really, really small number of bad guys. And uh, the answer is almost nothing. So what it says is if it's 
strict, meaning satisfies that condition that I showed you before, then basically uh, the only tasks you can solve are ones that require no communication. And again, I'm not going to prove that, but it's because you can't figure out what any inputs are. Uh, the, um, if it's non-strict, there are non-trivial tasks that, does, that, that can be solved. And this is something uh, we originally claimed that you couldn't do anything interesting, uh, but uh, some friends of ours uh, came up with a, uh, uh, some really weird uh, tasks, which, say, which are the form, pick some subset of values, and in that set is a valid value, even though you can never ever figure out which one it is. That's a non-strict uh, task, and that's uh, actually can be solved even uh, in lower dimensions, you know, with, 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 uh, with more uh, Byzantine uh, uh, processes. So let me summarize what, uh, what we did. So it says that the combinatorial topological tools that we developed for crash failure can be extended to Byzantine failure as, as well uh, in a fairly straightforward uh, way, and that the, the difference, which nobody had noticed before, is that only that you can tolerate fewer uh, uh, bad guys. And that's true for the strict tasks, strict colorless tasks, uh, which now most of the tasks we're interested in are strict colorless tasks, but there are others. And um, uh, we don't know much about those. Though there's, that's open uh, work that uh, uh, should be done. Uh, the observation that Byzantine processes have only one superpower, and that they can lie about their inputs of nothing else, has been implicit in a bunch of earlier work. But I don't think anybody really came out and said it in quite uh, the same way. So this isn't something we discovered, but this is something where I think we helped clarify uh, the, uh, uh, the situation. <coughs> so uh, we don't know what happens if, you are, if you're allowed to have your task depend on the identities of who, who gets things like you know, electing a leader, or things like that. And if tasks are non-strict, uh, it's also kind of unclear what uh, you can do. You know, non-strict tasks have this sort of weird, contrived look about them, but there might be a lot of interesting uh, things uh, there. Okay, that's it. Uh, in the place where, when we drop to the lower dimension, so uh, the idea is you're, you're sitting on some vertex of, say, a tetrahedron, and, and then you drop to the, to the uh, two skeleton or the one skeleton. If these, in, in colored tasks, the uh, simplexes are, are, are uh, the vertices are colored, and you'd have to drop to something of your own color, which means, which you can't uh, do in, in, in uh, this, uh, this case. You, you'd have to just first subdivide it and then drop to make sure that it was, it was colored. So it gets a lot more complicated. Other questions? Yeah. So is, is there a connection between this theoretical work and, and practical applications of like commercial tasks on the internet? Well, I if you were working for a funding agency, then uh, I would have one answer. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think ultimately, uh, yeah, there is some... Um, I can't say, oh yeah, this, here's a, 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 uh, an awesome practical application, but it does, I think, give you some clarity on what you can and uh, can't uh, do. And particularly, like all kinds of impossibility results, it says that if you, don't, if you want to do something that we say you can't do, it's, it's because you're using the wrong model. So something like um, uh, you know, Bitcoin, for example, is a real-world uh, Byzantine uh, protocol because you're, you don't trust anybody, and you're using all this cryptographic and, and randomized stuff. So it says you've got to go to a, a randomized uh, model if you want to do sort of more, if, if you want to tolerate a, a much larger number of untrustworthy participants. Because this says that if you wanted to do this uh, deterministically, then you can only tolerate a small number of um, untrustworthy people. But I wouldn't invest my money in a cryptocurrency that assumed that only one millionth of the uh, participants were dishonest. Mm -hmm. So people have done like a random version of this theory where you don't maybe know it's key, but it key has some distribution? That would be a really uh, interesting uh, topic, but uh, no, uh, nobody's, um, uh, uh, n nobody's done that. Uh, introducing randomization into this uh, kind of um, 
uh, tools is a, a problem that people have been sort of pushing at a little bit, but uh, nobody's made a real progress because it gets difficult uh, fairly, fairly quickly. But I think that would be a, an excellent PhD thesis for some masochistic person. Thank you.